hello and welcome to replay value. So to be entirely honest, I wasn't planning on coming back to Darling and the Frank until we wrapped up the first half of the show so that we could see where my predictions from the first episode landed, talk a bit about the motifs I brought up to see how they played out, and get down to some brass tacks about the thematics of the show. But since posting that first video, we have been getting a lot of comments asking us to do a follow-up, and I am nothing if not a people pleaser. So let's talk Darling and the Frank. I want to take a slightly different approach this time around because, again, I really don't want to just rehash the old motifs I already talked about and just show more examples of them. So instead I want to look at two scenes, one from episode 3 and one from episode 4, that highlight Hiro and O2's relationship dynamic, give a sense of their characters, and of course add to our understanding of the motifs of the show. The first scene is the balcony scene from episode 3, which begins with Hiro walking up to O2. She's sleeping, or at least pretending to be asleep, and we see Hiro focus on O2's horns, but in the reverse shot we don't see any reaction. There's no change in his face, no audio cue, nothing. And he gets thrown off guard when she tells him he's a perv, which is a nice throwback to their initial meeting at the lake. O2 takes the lead by saying, <laughs> cementing her as the proactive one in their relationship. The next shot of the barrier is super interesting. O2 can come and go as she pleases, whereas Hiro is blocked from accessing certain areas, which is a strong narrative tool to highlight how different the worlds they normally occupy are. But it's also a strong symbolic moment that Hiro, with O2's help, can go places he couldn't by himself. Compare this to him attempting to pilot with Ichigo, who similarly is locked in the same world and would be unable to take Hiro to a new horizon like O2 does in this scene. Of course, the dancing pose they take is also a great reminder of partnerships as we head out to the actual balcony. Hiro gets hit with a gust of wind and is amazed by the view in front of him, and it is a pretty grand shot of a cityscape, if a bit manufactured and samey. It's almost like a beehive, and the match of the color to the honey we see O2 consuming in episode 2 and in the OP is stunning. Hiro asks how O2 knew about this place, and she says, all plantations have similar designs, this is nothing special, with her eyes unmoving from the cityscape below the whole time. So while this is a huge deal for Hiro, who's never been to a place like this, it's routine and dull for O2, and I love this shot. Notice how the buildings ramp up in size with the slope of the line, how small O2 and Hiro look against this massive backdrop, and how everything is that same gold-orange color against black. This shot happens when they're talking about names, which is broken when O2 jumps over the railing and walks out onto the precarious ledge. Her response to this discussion of names is to say, which is compounded by the previous shot of them looking small against the cityscape. Their individuality means nothing in the face of this overwhelming sameness, which is furthered when O2 begins to talk about the lifelessness of the city, and the scene becomes letterboxed. O2 is effectively saying that the city is dead, a place without openness or freedom, represented for her by the sky and the ocean, but rather just a one-way street to a dead end. This also adds a lot of meaning to her saying that the lake where she met Hiro was the most ocean-like place she knows, because that means it's the closest she's come to freedom. The shot cuts back to Hiro who warns her that this isn't safe, literally her standing on the ledge, but also that her words aren't a safe mindset, which makes sense given that he's been trained since infancy to be a fighter to protect the society that she's calling dead. O2 asks Hiro to run away with her, before the letterbox breaks and our moment of seriousness between the two disappears. O2 throws a just kidding out there before the scene concludes, just to make sure you know that the letterboxing was done to highlight the dead serious mentality on her part. It also brings a focus on what O2 is saying and how she's saying it, and it's also indicative of a new perspective for Hiro, as what O2 is saying about the city and the possibility of leaving the plantation with her are both new concepts that he doesn't seem to have had prior. And for her part, it doesn't seem like O2 wants to leave and be without someone. Another throwback to the Jian story and her saying that the bird alone was incomplete. This scene shows how different Hiro and O2 are, from their experiences to what they hold important. Hiro caring about small things like names and his mission. Whereas O2 could care less about any of it, wanting to escape it all. It's not clear that these opposite elements necessarily make them a good pairing at this point though, something that the walkway flight scene in episode 4 serves to rectify. Episode 4's response to the balcony scene occurs when O2 is leaving the plantation and Hiro runs up to try and catch her, though we're going to take a brief detour to set the scene up properly by discussing this moment in the bath which in turn begins with O2 in the mech room staring at Strelitzia. Hiro walks into the room, and upon seeing her has a flashback to her injured partners, causing him to hide. This is a notable change from the previous episode, where Hiro walked up to O2 without any concern and showed no doubts. Then in the bath, we experience a moment that is the opposite of their first meeting, with Hiro naked and O2 jumping in the water fully clothed. 
but like the first meeting, Hiro is flustered by this, whereas O2 has no issue with the situation, which has O2 ask Hiro to leave here with her, again. But the sight of her horns makes him swallow, which is in stark contrast to the previous episode where he had no reaction, and raises the question of whether Hiro sees her as a human or a monster. Later, as O2 is being escorted by armed guards, Hiro runs up to one of the barriers we saw in episode 3 that he cannot pass. Again, he's literally stuck without her. Hiro properly conveys his feelings, that he doesn't care if she isn't human, that he's not worried about her status as the partner killer, and that he doesn't even really care about piloting Franks. Hiro confirms that O2 is his opposite, confident, self-assured, willing and able to fight properly, and that is why he says, it's a strong confession that reminds us of the birds motif and properly answers the question of whether their opposite natures would make them a good pair. It also resolves the previously proposed question of whether Hiro views her as human or monster, which ties into one of the newer thematic questions brought up, what does it mean to be special? Zero Two responds to this embarrassing speech by breaking through a glass wall to be with him, shattering expectations, and going through the gate in the same dance pose as in the previous episode, a nice callback, and showing that now Hiro can move forward. Zero Two ignores orders not to take off, and the letterboxing comes back in as the two take off to the sky. Hero's perspective has changed again, knowing definitively now that he can pilot with O2, which puts a nice little bow on the Gion story as together, they can fly. For now, at least. I'd be shocked if this was the end of the bird motif. It's also a callback to the balcony scene in episode 3, where O2 symbolically equates the ocean and the sky with freedom, and the two of them together can achieve that freedom in Strelitzia. This scene is also a great moment for understanding the relationship between O2 and Hiro as it stands now. O2 certainly opens up doors and opportunities for Hiro to experience new things and achieve his desires. But Hiro also gives O2 a sense of completeness and sees her as just her. Not as a monster, not as particularly special because of her blood, but special because they have a connection. And Hiro, who is almost always willing to conform to authority, is finally able to ignore it in episode 4, compared to episode 3 where he meekly accepted their decision to not let him pilot. My main question going forward is whether this will become an issue of dependence, either on one or both of them moving forward, as that seems to be a logical direction for their relationship to go, without going down the generic misunderstandings causing them to be unable to sync route. There's also a lot to talk about with the sexual themes in the confession and flight scene, and like all of the piloting, but we'll be doing a big analysis of all of that at some point in the future, so I don't want to step on our own toes. Let's just say that the beehive aesthetic was probably intentional for now, and we'll definitely be coming back to this one real soon. So one stray thought before we hit some recommendations. The music that plays during the balcony scene makes use of an instrument that sounds like a bird call at times, which is the first time I've noticed that and has me hoping that we'll see slash hear more audio-visual tie-ins of themes in the future. Well, I hope this satisfies your Zero Two style sweet tooth until a few more Darling in the Franks episodes come out so that we can really dig into some of the new stuff and hopefully provide a bit more depth to the motifs and themes we've already discussed. If you haven't seen that episode one analysis, click to the left, or if you want another currently airing show where we get deep into the content, check out Violet Evergarden to the right. Right. Leave a comment telling us if you liked it or not, and if this tickles your fancy, you can subscribe as well. And as always, thanks for watching.